This video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, a free high-quality business and finance newsletter. Check out the link in the description below to sign up. For most people, their home will be their biggest asset, liability, and purchase all in one. It's an understatement to say that housing is incredibly important to everybody, and for even more reasons than being a basic human need. The financial success of families, communities, and countries are intertwined with real estate, which is why it seems silly that people can just take these homes and legally claim them as their own. Squatters' rights on the surface sound ridiculous. Reports exist of families going on vacation for as little as three weeks before coming back to their home with change locks and a new family living in it. People in these situations can't rely on law enforcement because they are too powerless to remove these people from a home that they claim as their own. A soldier from Florida had to go through months of civil court to rid his home of squatters who would move onto his property while the soldier was deployed in Afghanistan. Even after successfully appealing the squatter's claim to the property, the serviceman was left with thousands of dollars in damages that he had no way of recuperating off the evicted squatters. This horrible situation is also unique to housing. After all, you can't steal a car, hide it in your garage for a year, and then claim it as yours. So if that kind of legal protection extends to automobiles, why not your most important assets? Well, it's mostly because without the rules that make nightmare scenarios like this possible, our housing system simply wouldn't work at all. To find out why, it's time to learn how money works, which was made possible today by The Daily Upside. The Daily Upside is a totally free high-quality email newsletter with a strong focus on business and finance. Their short articles are written daily by industry insiders and former investment bankers who are able to make sense of world events in a way that is both informative and simple to understand. It's even simple enough for me while I'm working through my first coffee in the morning. Do you want to know the real reason why Elon Musk is now the biggest shareholder in Twitter? Or why Walmart truck drivers are earning the same as Goldman Sachs analysts? Well, you would know if you were subscribed to The Daily Upside. Sign up using the link below to make sure to keep up to date with everything in the world of business and finance with The Daily Upside. Squatters rights, like a lot of things wrong with America, originated in England. This place is seriously old, and it's filled with land claims that date back hundreds of years. Squatters rights were originally established because it was almost impossible to keep track of who owned what at a time when all records were kept on paper, stashed in damp towers, and watched over by a barely literate population. The laws were set up to avoid two things, wasted space and wars. Landowners in the Middle Ages were nobility, and they owned thousands of acres. Most of this land was used for farming or hunting. Unused land was wasted land that would be better off in the hands of another lord who could use it to feed the kingdom. Use of land, being the decider of ownership, forced the lords to use it or lose it, so to speak. It also avoided a situation where two lords would try to claim ownership over the same piece of unused land. Internal wars were bad for kingdoms, so higher lords would usually settle these squabbles by awarding the land to whoever they determined to be the person using it. As the world got less feudal, it made sense to keep these laws in place, because all of a sudden, regular peasants were starting to own land of their own. Oh, and these people could vote on who made their laws now, so lawmakers wanted to keep them happy. Land use rights prevented a great-great-great-great-grandchild of a lord finding a land deed in a dungeon somewhere and using it to claim ownership over a new housing development. I think most of you can agree that that kind of situation is worth avoiding, but where is the line drawn? What time frame is too long, or too short? Records have only been migrated onto computer databases in the last three decades at most. If you live in a country that's been around for more than 100 years, it's almost a certainty that there is a document out there that says your land belongs to someone else. The difficulty in keeping records indefinitely is why most legal systems have a statute of limitations. In plain English, a time limit on the events you can challenge legally. Records get lost, stolen, destroyed, forged, and even hacked. The last thing a law-abiding homeowner would want is for someone to come along and claim that their home actually didn't belong to them. Land use laws are designed to protect people from these situations. This is also why squatters' rights style laws don't apply to cars or other goods. Land is unique in the sense that it's the only commodity not created with human labor, and that can last indefinitely. A block of land was created 4.5 billion years ago. A car is at most 100 years old, so they are not liable to have the same problems with multiple ownership claims. One exception to this is that there are variations of squatters' rights rules that do exist for things like ancient artifacts. Any given ancient Greek statue will have a different legal owner today than the first person who laid claim to it hundreds of years ago. Okay, so maybe these laws make sense in a place like England, but what about America? It's been ruled by one single system of government since its independence, so why do we need these laws? 
Well, for much of the same reasons. Early American settlers basically just claimed land out west, and records were even worse than what existed in Europe at the time. So sorry my fellow Americans, we aren't any better than the Europeans. Not to mention the fact that none of us really want to be beating our chest too loudly about eternal land ownership rights now, do we? At this point, I should probably explain what squatters' rights are, because what we are hearing about when we read stories like this are not in fact squatters' rights, they are instead civil disputes over oral contracts. In America, oral contracts are just as binding as written and signed contracts. They are just much harder to dispute because it just becomes a case of he said, she said. If a family moves into an empty home, law enforcement is in most instances powerless to remove them. But this has nothing to do with squatters' rights. People just assume squatters' rights are at play here because the people taking the home are called squatters. The reason that police cannot bust them out of their home is because the squatting occupants can claim that the home is theirs, or that they are renting it, or that they have a private agreement in place with the owners to live there. Police officers are not judges, and they cannot and should not have the authority to make discretionary decisions about people's housing arrangements. That's the job of the courts. Needing to take squatters to court to prove that no oral contract was established is unbelievably frustrating, but it's better than the alternative. If you have a private agreement with roommates to pay a share of rent every month, you don't want to get thrown out on your ass by the police because your roommates are sick of you cooking fish in the communal microwave. Although, honestly, that should be considered a war crime. It's also not right that landlords could get police to kick families out of a rented home if they weren't able to provide suitable evidence of rights to residency right then and there on the spot. Think to yourself, if a police team busted into your home today and tried to kick you out, how would you definitely prove that you owned the place and weren't just living in there as a squatter? It's not that easy, and that's why we have courts. And while you're going to go through that court process, you would probably appreciate being able to stay in your home while you prove that you definitely do or do not have the right to live there. Actual squatters' rights cases are extremely rare. All of those stories are just legal challenges that needed their day in court. Okay, but what if you wanted to get a free house by exploiting these laws? How would you go about doing that? As a renter in the Bay Area, I will admit that thought has crossed my mind. Well, in America, it's almost impossible to get squatter's rights, with almost being the operative word here. To claim squatter's rights, you need to move on to a property that you reasonably believe to be your own. This is basically impossible in suburbs or cities because land holdings in these areas are well defined by fences and buildings. A patch of land directly adjacent to a poorly demarcated field is probably your best bet. Sometimes it's hard to know where your field ends and where your neighbors begins. Mistakes happen. The second important step is that you need to prove that you didn't have permission from the actual landowners to dwell on the property. This might sound counterintuitive, but if a landowner says it's cool for you to stay in their house, then they have acknowledged your lodging, and you have acknowledged their ownership. Think of it this way. If your friend came over to your house, and they told you they would let you sleep in your bed, you would immediately challenge that statement by saying, you're goddamn right I'm allowed to sleep in my bed, it's my damn bed. If someone with no rightful claim to a land holding gave permission to the rightful landowner to use the land, the legal assumption is that the true landowner would challenge the assumption that the land is not theirs in court. So if you want a free house, you can't have permission to live in it, and you have to be able to prove it was reasonable for you to think that you owned it. You then need to maintain this status quo for the duration of the statute of limitations period in your civil jurisdiction. For California, that's 10 years. For other places, it's as little as one or as much as 100 years. Your mileage will vary. Once you have done that, the property is yours for all intents and purposes. If the previous owner challenges your claim, they won't be able to provide proof of ownership that falls within the statute of limitations timeframe. The same rules that stop a 7th generation lord claiming medieval land holdings are the same rules that will stop a family unlucky enough to leave an unmarked piece of land unattended for just slightly too long. On a positive note, as digital records and satellite mapping become standard practices, these kinds of disputes are going to become far less common than they already are. So sorry, if you thought this was your only chance at owning a home, you are probably going to need a better plan. Maybe a side hustle to accelerate your savings plan, but then again, maybe not. Go and watch my video outlining all of the lies you have been told about side hustles and multiple streams of income to find out why. Thanks again to The Daily Upside for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works.